Good afternoon. Welcome to Gaining Information Advantage Alliances and Partnerships virtual event. Now, please welcome ENSA Vice President John Doyen. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the second installment of the ENSA Foundation's 2023 Future of the IC Workforce Gaining Information Advantage webinar series. Underwritten by Kinetic, this three part series seeks to shine a light on issues impacting the IC's ability to maintain information advantage over its adversaries. We launched the series in May with a discussion about the IC workforce and what is needed to attract and retain a highly skilled data savvy workforce. Today, we are tackle, tackling alliances and partnerships and how information advantage can be gained by drawing on our partners' unique access, collection capabilities, and analytic insights. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have questions, and we hope you do, please submit them through the questions box on the right side of your screen. Our moderator will do her best to get to all of your questions. Also, we are pleased to welcome members of the press to the call today. This is a reminder that this program is on the record and is being recorded. You'll find the recording along with a recap on the INSA website later this week. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator. A longstanding friend of INSA's, Lindy Kaiser, is the Director of Content and PR at Clearance Jobs, the largest career site and online community dedicated to security cleared professionals. Lindy is a former Department of Army civilian and is a passionate advocate for improving the pathways into national security careers for both government and industry applicants. Lindy, welcome. And over to you. Thank you so much for having me, John, and thank you um, to Kinetic for sponsoring and underwriting the series, and also to Insa and Insif. Really appreciate it and love these conversations and these dialogues. I'm very thrilled to have with us Major General Michelle McGinnis and David Catler, um, General McGinnis with the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, David Catler with NATO. General McGinnis is, McGinnis is on. Uh, video cam today david is joining us with the delightful photo but he is very much here and in person look forward to i'm um, hearing his voice soon by way of introduction one of the interesting things about this call is we're talking about information advantage um, and obviously how that applies to our alliances and partnerships today it's significant in both of your roles general mcginnis you're here um, you are an australian general but working for the defense intelligence agency this is not your first time serving in one of these co capacities or roles so you were very well of kind of the interagency interalliance um, david catler you are um, a defense and intelligence professional who has a, had a long career in the u.s but you are currently serving in nato in brussels so both of you are kind of um, an ocean away from from home per se and serving in these neat capacities so again, by way of introducing yourselves, because I'm I'm a terrible reader and don't read bios, I wanted you to kind of speak to your role and capacity, what that looks like, again, being kind of um, an ocean away from maybe your home, but representing an alliance per se. So first I'll start with you, General Miss, and then go to um, David to do the same. Hey, thanks, Lindy, and, uh, and thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I am uh, an embed working here at DIA as the Deputy Director for Commonwealth Integration. Uh, the job's been around since 2015 and it's been filled by Commonwealth partners, first a British officer and then a New Zealander before me. Um, it is a distinct privilege uh, and as rewarding as it is challenging uh, to work in this role. I do work for uh, General Barrier and for the USDINS, uh, sorry, and for USDIA and for USIC leaders in support of pursuing, uh, maximizing our integration, solidifying and amplifying the powerful effects of our partnership um, from the inside. So um, it's a fantastic opportunity. I sometimes do confess that it is uh, maybe the most awkward job in the IC, being a, a foreigner working inside and for the enterprise, um, supporting the enterprise in how they can best leverage those amazing, powerful benefits of alliances. Uh, as you said, it's not my first time here. I have had the distinct privilege of serving probably around eight or nine of the last 20 years uh, in the US in different roles and capacities. I've been an embed, I've been liaison, uh, I've been an attache, uh, I've had the privilege of studying here for a little bit. So it is fantastic to be back here. And certainly DIA is where my journey started back in 2005, where I worked in this building uh, then too. So it's a great privilege to be back here and advising the, the director and the leadership on how to best um, really solidify those um, 
the power of alliances through irreversible and systemic change. Um, and finally, I just say that I, I now often talk about how this role is really the practical embodiment of the major partner lines of effort that we see across a range of strategies consistently expressed in the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and our own DIA uh, intelligence strategy. Fantastic. And so same question to you, David. So you are um, an American, but serving in NATO. What is kind of your function and role there in NATO? Well, thanks, Lindy. And again, I also appreciate the invitation uh, from INSA and your moderation today. But yeah, so I'm the Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security at NATO. Uh, my post has been uh, part of the structure since 2016, when there was a pretty big strategic reform for intelligence and security in the alliance framework uh, coming out of the Warsaw Summit. I'm the second ASG in this role uh, and the first American. The idea was um, to bring the intelligence functions together into an enterprise approach and to better link intelligence and security together. Um, partner engagement is a key part of my role uh, because while I am an American, in this case, the US is one of soon to be 32 allies and I work for all 32 on behalf of the Secretary General. With 32 allies, we have more than 80 intelligence and security services in the Alliance. And a large part of my job is to make sure that they have what they need, uh, that their contributions, whether personnel or information are protected the way they wish, and that they all gain benefit. Um, so I just wrap up my introduction by saying really three key roles for me. First is to ensure that there's a really high level of security that meets not just the NATO security standards, but the standards that the intelligence and security services themselves demand, and for the personnel contribution and the contribution of information. The second is to ensure that allies get at 32, so meaning all of them simultaneously, the same intelligence-driven insights and advice. And finally, the constantly work to raise the baseline level of knowledge across the alliance, uh, because our theory of the case is that good decision-making is really highly reliant on both intelligence and security. And uh, the two really do work very well together in this framework. So back over to you. Thank you. And so my first question to you, General McInnes, is referring to kind of, obviously there's a big push right now for the five eyes saying, hey, do we need a different line of sight? So it's the obvious question um, that comes anytime we have a forum like this, you know, what is the current status of increasing the five eyes? It is the oldest intelligence sharing relationship we have grounded since 1946 um, but there's been a push Japan Germany several other countries like South Korea um, kind of what is what is the status there of increasing the five eyes is that a legitimate topic of question or conversation hey thanks Lindy I don't think I ever get away without addressing this question um, you know expanding and strengthening partnerships both new and evolving as well as empowering partners and allies is critical. And I already touched on the criticality of partnerships and allies in every strategy that we're dealing from nuclear and cyber through to defense and national security. Um, we, you know, we are an increasingly interconnected world. And I think history has shown, um, I think this is an important point that the US has um, never been more effective than it is when working with partners and allies around shared challenges and threats. Um, partnering clearly enhances capability, stability, deterrence, uh, indeed, we use partnering to mitigate uh, risks through integrating and partnering around the globe. Um, as you mentioned, the Five Eyes have existed for over 100 years. Uh, it is a well-founded, uh, uh, deeply rooted in blood and treasure, fought together for over 100 years. I, I think what I'd say about the Five Eye Partnership is, first and foremost, it's not a gift. Um, like most of our partnerships or all of our partnerships and alliances, it's about participants and not recipients. And all players, importantly, and I think this is where the Five Eyes um, have formed and evolved and constantly evolved, all players involved um, meet or exceed the standards. It is deep trust, but with verification. And that is individually, organisationally, institu institutionally, meet and exceed the standards. That's a really high cost. And it's also a significant burden and something that's evolved over decades and decades. So to your question, I know I've skirted around this a little bit, to your question about is the, is the Five Eyes still relevant or is it something bigger? Um, I, the Five Eyes will always exist. But critically, I don't think it's ever, ever been more pressing um, that we appreciate, respect, grow and empower the other partnerships. 
none of the strengths around the five eyes preclude or reduce the criticality criticality of the numerous bilateral and multilateral forums um, that the US is building, that all of us are building, and indeed at times leverage that five eye partnership, that five eye foundation. It's really hard to jump in on the five eyes because it's been decades of building. Um, but we all work incredibly closely with really important um, new, old and evolving partnerships in, as I said, trilaterally, bilaterally, multilaterally. And I think there is great goodness and those partners often reap the benefits of the Five Eye Intelligence sharing relationship. Fantastic. Thank you. So, David, I have a, a slightly easy, but I'm going to punch you a little bit at the beginning of this question. So NATO always always goes the rounds. You know, if you if you follow the think tank circle, the, the death of NATO, the importance of NATO, what who NATO is as an organization always comes back. Um, and even with the war in Ukraine, you would kind of think that maybe some of that stopped. But I've seen a series of op eds even since saying, you know, it's you know, what's what's the latest with NATO, even as you're growing. Um, so maybe can you talk about that? You know, that issue for NATO, we're talking about the Five Eyes potentially expanding. Why is there kind of this complicated relationship around NATO? Maybe what has um, it, potentially some of the successes around intelligence sharing um, with the war in Ukraine, has that helped to bolster kind of what your role is and what you do as an organization? Because we certainly see renewed interest from international partners in joining that, I think, because of that effort. Let's pretend I just asked a question. Yeah, no, I got it. Um, no, thanks, Lindy. Look, I think it, first and foremost, I think it's important to remind people that NATO was founded um, after World War II to really sustain the alliance frameworks uh, that the U.S. and the allies during the war had participated in, and then they've expanded over the past 75 years. I mean, keep in mind that the Washington summit next year uh, is, in fact, also the 75th anniversary of the NATO alliance. And as you said, I, I think the, the rate at which members have joined has ebbed and flowed, but it's been quite significant since the end of the Cold War. Um, I joined uh, the NATO leadership team in December of 2019, and when Sweden joins, we will have had four new allies join just since 2019. And as you mentioned, um, in the lead up to the question that I took, um, you know, look, in the summer, fall of 2019, there were a lot of op-eds written about the question of whether NATO was brain dead. And I just highlight that we go from that to, I think, everybody seeing with the war uh, that Russia has reignited within Ukraine, that the NATO alliance is probably the most powerful and most significant alliance uh, really in modern history. And so I think quite a huge contribution that we make collectively to security for the Euro-Atlantic area. Um, I, I think that when you look at the things that an alliance can do, there are many things that individual nations may choose to take up on their own where they have great uh, capability. But I think the reality is that, that anytime you're going to get into a crisis of a certain scale and certainly a war, it's highly unlikely that you're going to fight alone. You're going to want other nations alongside you. And when I think about the infrastructure, the capability, and the power that NATO has, I'm really hard pressed to imagine that if it had not been founded and around for 75 years and you needed to do it today, could it even be done? And if it could, how long would it take to reach even just a level of political and military solidarity that you could take decisions together and then see real action uh, to say nothing of the infrastructure that's been built in really high quality staff, decision making processes and all these relations with these nations. You know, 32 allies, we have several we call the partners around the globe. Uh, Australia is one of them, uh, very key to the alliance. And I just you know, link back to the question you asked Michelle and point out that all of the members of the Five Eye also participate within NATO and have participated in combat operations through the NATO framework, whether allies or partners. So again, I, I, think, I think the role that the alliance plays for regional security and stability and for collective security is really very profound and probably irreplaceable in this era and looking forward. Back to you. Awesome. And I know I, want, I love that kind of tease into the next question that I wanted to ask. Andrew Boreen asked about ways for U.S. companies to be involved in supporting increasing integration. And I thought that that was an interesting conversation because normally when I'm thinking about this for companies, I'm thinking of the ways that they're jacking it up or more like patting them on the hands because they're potentially taking money or doing something internationally that's not helpful. Um, so I love that he, Andrew asked it in a positive way, like what are ways that companies can kind of help with this information intelligence sharing 
integration capacity. And I'm not smart enough to know what those are. So I'm so glad both of you are on the line. You're, I can actually see you and you're, you're nodding. David, you, you, you lose because I can't see your face. So I'm going to tee it to you, General McGinnis, if anything comes to mind. Are there ways that companies can kind of support what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely, Lindy. There, I'm really grateful for the question as well because I think that in the past, um, our industry partners probably haven't imagined or foreseen the requirement to share. You know, this is a series about information advantage. If we don't envisage the end user when we're dealing with whether it be a capability, technology, or a policy, then we probably fail to see. Um, we probably fail to build in the right processes, capabilities, releaseability of that system. So I think it's really important that as our business partners work with us, they have in their mind that their end customer might not be a US person. And so there are things that they need to bear in mind, whether it be around proprietary, whether it be around sharing, whether it be around um, setting the technology to allow our policy makers to have that decision space. So at the right time to turn on a policy lever that says share. And we've seen no greater example of that than the Russia-Ukraine crisis when our policy, you know, we had rapid policy adjustments in order to, to share um, with those that needed the information, traditional and non-traditional partners. For seeing that as we build capabilities, as we invest in systems and platforms and understanding that the end user might not be US, I think makes all the difference. I think integration um, can never be a bolt on. It can never just be the sprinkling on top. It's gotta be foreseen. It's never as efficient or effective unless it's built in. So I'd offer that to, um, to Andrew who asked the question. Thank you very much. David, did you have to talk on that one too? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, look, I, we're actually doing a lot to do um, not just outreach to various corporations, but also to improve the numbers of venues and the relevance of the venues in which we partner with the private sector, uh, either paid or unpaid. And just a, a few topics, and then I'll talk about one big development since last year's Madrid Summit. Uh, areas in our business, open source, big data, AI, machine learning, cyber, cybersecurity, space, and ISR. Uh, and not just sensors in the ISR, but also uh, processing, exploitation, and dissemination, I should say tasking too. So TPED, in that case, are all areas where we have specific efforts underway. Um, and in several of those that I listed, in fact, um, uh, open opportunities for the private sector to offer services and bid as well to participate in some new projects that are coming online. Uh, but I really want to put a plug in here for an agreement reached at the Madrid Summit for something called Diana, and that's the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic. So this is going to concentrate on emerging and disruptive technologies the Alliance has identified as priorities, including many of the things I touched on, but also quantum-enabled technologies, autonomy, biotech, novel materials, and space. And think of this as a network of innovation sites in North America and Europe that allies have identified to provide links to as contributions uh, that they would make to the Alliance. We have regional offices in Canada, the Netherlands, and in the UK. And these are gonna work with startups, the private sector, universities, and today's innovators to try to address critical defense and security cha uh, challenges. And they'll have access to a network then that the allies will identify more than nine accelerator sites and 63 test centers across Europe and North America. And I think something for the private sector to keep in mind is that this isn't just about having like DARPA and IARPA plug in and similar um, places like that, that other allies have, but allies have also committed to invest more than a billion euros within, within the, uh, uh, for us at least, the first multi-sovereign venture capital fund. And what they wanna do is invest that billion euros over the next 15 years in startups to fund the development of dual use emerging tech. And that fund will then engage early with private sector startups and bridge the gap between the private sector and the defense and security world um, through, again, through that NATO framework. They are just now, in fact, uh, making the first set of approaches and holding their conferences for this. So uh, I think you can tell, even though you can't see me, I'm pretty excited about this because it's real money um, and a real commitment from allies to do this. And I, and I think it's really going to change the way that we work with the private sector. Back to you. I, I could sense the excitement right there. I, money always gets me excited too, but it just shows the investment. I think when you're willing to invest, I mean, and that's one of the criticisms of NATO, especially around US involvement is, you know, how are other countries getting involved? So I, I love to highlight that. A question came in from Tony Cawthron, which is near and dear to my heart. I'm asking about, you know, specific to you, David, but I'd love to 
for you to respond to this too, General McInnes, if it um, teases your interest. So talk about experiences early in your career that have best prepared you for where you are today. Obviously, I work for a career site, so I love topics like this, but it's also why these INSA INSIF events are so um, important because I think this is one of the rare avenues where you can have somebody like DNI Clapper on the phone along with a, an entry level college student who's very interested in the intelligence career. And I think we're only successful if we have engagement and interest from the highest up folks and then the brand new folks at the at the starting gate looking to launch a career in intelligence. So again, I'll ask you that question first, David. Um, can you think about early career experiences in intelligence and defense that have best prepared you for where you're at and doing um, the work you are with NATO? Well, thanks, Libby. Um, and I appreciate Tony's question. Uh, I worked for Tony, actually, early in my career and really benefited from his leadership and, and mentorship not just at that time, uh, but also as we've sustained our friendship over the years. Um, look, I, I began my intelligence career in naval intelligence and not as a naval intelligence officer, but actually a surface warfare officer doing my first shore tour at the Office of Naval Intelligence. And, and Tony's heard me say it, but I just shared with the audience that I really feel like I learned a lot of what I know, actually, and what I use even today uh, from that time in naval intelligence and my sustained relationships, because I think that uh, we teach our officers and enlisted to be very well-rounded, to be multi-domain in their approach, often operate independently or only in very small groups to support their units and higher level commands. And I think that sets a really strong foundation in each person with a naval intelligence officer enlisted and civilian to approach a great range of challenges. Um, I think it also teaches you to be very, very open-minded. I mean, the sea is is huge, right? 60% of the surf, or the Earth's surface. Uh, and as you travel around on deployments, you're gonna come in contact with a lot of allies and partners. And so partner engagement is really, a, from very early in your career, a very key element of the tools and the core relationships that, are gonna, that you're gonna draw upon. So, you know, I just say, I, I'm really proud that I started my career in naval intelligence. And, and I think that you can tell from my view that I feel like many of the things that, that I learned first uh, and that have endured in my training, I learned there and from them. Back to you. See, I'm an army girl and I refuse to give up my allegiance, but there is something about naval intelligence. I think it must be hunt for Red October because you guys do launch a fantastic career. So. There's some entry level career advice, I guess, naval intelligence. General McGinnis, did you have any thoughts there? Early career experiences that helped you today? Uh, you know, I'm with you, Lindy, Army intelligence. Um, the uh, <laughs> very similar to, to Dave um, about, you know, you mentioned being open minded. I think of, you know, really critical thinkers. For me personally, this has been a, uh, a neat journey that I could not have predicted or planned, having served in and for the US on a number of occasions. It's not as unique as you, as you might think across the 5i intelligence enterprise in that we do send exchanges, embeds, liaisons, and we look to build that interoperability through to interchangeability so we can burden share. And we can talk about that later. I would say um, when it comes to partnering, and Dave touched on this as well, uh, it's a fool's errand to think they're all alike. And even across the 5i's, you can be forgiven for thinking we're, um, we're the same and we're not. And I think that preparing for engagement across with partners um, cultural competency is the most important thing you, you can bring. I think uh, linguists, whilst having a language um, for those who, who aren't linguists, it um, you know it does go into a lot of culture. So understanding how different cultures work, how different languages works, helps you understand that we're not all the same um, as as people across the world. Having that appreciation, um, deep curiosity, be always curious, and then in in jobs like this deeply it is my role to understand the policies and the laws that underpin what the US can and can't do in this space that I'm responsible for advising on so being deeply knowledgeable about those issues that are different and that do uh, present as potential barriers or areas where we can uh, find maneuver space to, to make things work but I would say that the greatest um, career developing issue for me is probably that cultural competency and I've worked with a lot of partners not just five eyes um, and there are jobs that um, we should all aspire to. They're incredibly rewarding and, and fulfilling and challenging. So back to you. So we have the workforce question teed up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask mine now because I do, um, I really wanna get you, your guys' perspective on this. It was something, General McGinnis, that you spoke to a little bit the last time you did a webinar with INSA and INSIP and related to 
Um, what are the innovative ways we're looking at sharing personnel across this space? And I, it comes up a lot. It ties into a lot of the other topics we've had around how can companies get better involved? Because um, we now pretty much say, Ellen McCarthy, former head of INR, has one of my favorite quotes around this. Our intelligence is no longer our best resource. Our insights are our best resource. The best way to share insights is like through that cultural competency that you said, it is through the people sharing component. Um, is what we're doing right now with our current embed information sharing, people sharing programs, is that enough? Are there innovative ways that we can look at sharing, maybe not even just through some of these conventional ways, um, but how can we better really kind of bolster our workforce through the people sharing component? I'll ask you that first and then David, I'll hit you with that one too. Yeah, thanks, Lindy. Um, this is a, a key line of effort, uh, and I and I imagine I did speak about it a few a year or so ago when we spoke at Insight because it has been a priority for DAA to increase the number of embeds, and it's waxed and waned. And I think that's um, been expected as we've um, increased our presence in joint deployed forward uh, theatres, and then as we uh, wind back from some of those commitments, ensuring that we have that human to human connection, which I think you're spot on. Uh, it, it's the critical part of it, the insights and the human and the relationships and the trust that you build from knowing um, each other and understanding and, and carrying that trust over to organisations and institutions. Um, in terms of, of embedding, it's never, it's, it's, it's never seamless, um, but there are things that we've done. And again, it goes to setting out uh, on such a journey with the end state in mind. So there are a lot that we can do about the way we, we set up our facilities, the way we set up our IT, the way we set up our, our floor plan to better integrate all partners to ensure that um, we can achieve and satisfy security requirements for everyone. I did. Um, I do have a little bit of exciting news, which many of our listeners might have heard in the media, but um, DAA has recently um, kicked off a, a, a initiative with Australia, which will see embeds in what we're, what is called the KICA, the Combined Intelligence uh, Centre Australia. Um, I I would. I would say quite frankly that embedding in partner nations is easier um, than sometimes coming here into the US in that they have been built and designed with integration in mind across technology policy and, and even culture. Um, but there are some great new developments as we seek to expand our footprint, integrated footprint across the globe. And there are plenty of examples both within the Five Eyes and beyond where um, partners are embedded and liaising uh, in location. But this is an exciting new initiative. Um, Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister of Australia, Richard Miles, um, uh, noted it in the uh, recent outcomes from Osmin. Uh, it, it is a bilateral initiative that will work uh, across Five Eyes, as is the history of our intelligence enterprise. Okay, so same question to you, David. Are there you know, innovative ideas across NATO for better sharing people and not just classified information? Yeah, well, look, I'll probably start with um, an informal answer and then give you some technical specifics. Um, first, the informal answer. Uh, our business, if you define it as intelligence and security, I think is inherently a people business. It is based on our personal interactions and relationships, uh, I'd argue probably almost as much, if not more so, than it is based on all the formal agreements that we sign with each other. Because if the people do not give life to those agreements, then they kind of don't matter as much as they should and as much as our leaders think they will uh, when they give the political consent for us to pursue them. And, and I think that's interesting if you keep it in mind, because I think also nearly every intelligence and security officer gets deep training on counterintelligence and how to protect ourselves. And unfortunately, a lot of it, uh, at least in the very beginning, when you're junior and you're less aware of how the business works, tends to be so defensive, I would argue, to a point that you really you can't do much almost with another human being, but certainly not uh, with someone from a foreign country. And I think it takes a lot of experience um, and a lot more training and a lot more interaction with partners in a range of settings in order for you to get your inhibitions still maintained at a proper level, um, but lowered enough that you can actually work coherently um, in, these, in these arrangements with other nations. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind so people business and build on one of Michelle's points to one of your previous questions. I mean, with, with 30, Again, I kind of saying with 32 allies, Sweden on the way, but not in. So let's just let me stipulate 31 allies today, but soon to be 32. 
with 32 allies, it's not just that you have to know each nation and the culture and the history and the relationships, but with 80 services, you have to really understand the personality of the 80 services, their directors, uh, their directors of international engagement to really um, be able to listen to them, to bring them in, to meet them where they want to be uh, and to get the best of them. I tend to argue that when leaders say that they want to um, join the alliance and participate, when they think about intelligence and security, they're assuming that they get to draw upon all of the other allies and a lot of the partners, all of their intelligence and security capabilities. And I consider it a, a key part of my job to try to get them that effect, actually. Now, some technical things. We have some common standards across the alliance uh, in security policy that include things like vetting, protection of classified material, um, and so on. So we have a common basis so that when you join the alliance, uh, you know exactly what you need to meet and what you need to do in order to achieve the proper level so that your personnel can serve in military and civilian roles. You cannot be a, an employee, whether military or civilian of the NATO Alliance, unless you are from a member state. In some cases, you can be a dual citizen. Um, if you're properly vetted again, and you meet those standards and so on. Uh, and we have in fact welcomed partner officers, military and civilian into the headquarters, uh, into operations in the field and so on. And then we have partner agreements uh, and parallel security agreements with them. So we'll have a political agreement that sets the, that's two way, that sets a, a common baseline that political leaders agree. It says our ambition includes, we will do the following things. And if it specifies exchange of personnel, then there'll be a link to the relevant policies. Those parties will agree that they will meet and do meet those standards. And then uh, depending on, again, what's been agreed and what's at hand, we can exchange personnel, information, connect IT systems and so on. Um, but it really is all built around a common trust basis and a whole lot of personal uh, engagement in order to, to get it going and sustain it. Back to you. We've had a lot of questions come in about, again, they love to talk about expansion, specific expansion. What will it take for the Indo PACAP to get it? Paycom to get in, uh, asking about, you know, post-Soviet countries and their alignment, um, a lot of it very regional, you know, specific or, or asking what the, what the, what the barriers for entry are. It sounds like, David, you kind of just responded to that. Within NATO, you kind of have a, a list of requirements there. Um, General McGinnis, I feel like you, you spoke to that a little bit too, kind of saying um, the Five Eyes is the Five Eyes, but there are certainly other alignments and engagements out there. So maybe kind of by way of segueing all of those kind of random who gets in and who gets out questions, can you talk to information sharing that it doesn't have to fit that bucket? Because even just know examples from Japan and their recent cyber incident, it, they didn't have to meet a bar for us to want to help out and reach out and say, hey, you're you're being compromised, you're being breached. I think um, there is this, this organic information sharing that is obviously very top down and, and driven from that but when, when we're not just going to say you don't we're not going to tell you about that because you're not in our club correct and maybe can you speak to that and how how does it happen when you see something that needs to be shared across uh another international you're not just saying you have to be the five eyes for us to tell you that you need to do something from a security perspective pretend i asked a question general mcginnis does that does any of that like because it's not just you don't have to be in the five eyes you're gonna how how does that look organically when you're kind of like helping out outside of the scope of just those five eyes countries yeah linda let me have a crack i will say you're breaking up a tiny bit and i i worry i've missed some critical part of that um but you know the five eyes um let's talk about partners and alliances how critical is indo paycom aoi right now it's absolutely critical to managing and maintaining our global norms and partnering there to maintain stability and security for all and really when we partner we all become more secure i think you touched on cyber security and vulnerabilities it is in absolutely in all of our interests to share that we partners um, it, it's in the same vein as open source intelligence the more we can harness this the better flexibility we have over sharing information. I don't think we've ever seen greater information sharing over the, than over the last year as we've released um, to the public things that the public need to know. Um, back to the cyber issue. Uh, increasingly, as we work together with a range of partners, I'd argue that a threat to one is a risk to all. 
I, I think that extends across different sectors as well. I think increasingly, um, you know, national security is not just um, constrained to defence and national security professionals. I think our economies, our academia, our industry, our services sector, they're all vulnerable and it behoves those who identify particularly cyber vulnerabilities to work with those partners to provide um, security, to, to provide advance notice and warning so that we can maintain and build the foundation for better information sharing. You know, we talk about our appetite and our desire to share with a broad range of partners and uh, Dave mentioned as well, the US doesn't go to, into conflict alone. I don't think we should go into competition or being competition alone. We, you know, the US, I'd argue, throughout history is at its best when it partners with, with others. Um, but to do that, you do need to have secure and swift uh, ability to communicate um, in a timely and effective manner. And that has got to do with maintaining um, systems, not just secure systems, but ensuring that cyber vulnerabilities aren't impacting our partners that then pose a risk to everyone else. It's about how you are a good partner, um, how you bring your strengths to the relationship. You know, that's the other bit about partnering. All of us come, every country comes with its own unique, diverse strengths, either niche or complementary or interoperable. Or interoperable. Um, but identifying where those strengths lie, and I, I'd argue that um, the US and, and other partners have particular strengths in recognising those cyber vulnerabilities and sharing with other partners where we want them to bring their strengths as well and helping them uh, close those gaps is uh, is great for everyone. Uh, you know, it impacts all of our security. Hopefully I, I did that okay, Lindy. Back to you. That was what I wanted. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that. Sorry. Sometimes, I, you know, you start consolidating too many questions together and then you're a little blonde headed, things, things happen. So Jeff Trussler asked an actual question. So thank you, Jeff, for sending that in to save me. So what do you think are the barriers to allied interoperability in a contested electronic warfare environment? Very direct question. David or General McGinnis, do you have a response to that? I, I love that Jeff's got to ask a hard question, you know, in that. Um, probably just some high level points on this for me and then and then maybe michelle will want to want to clean <laughs> want to help me out or add something else i think i think first look um it's always complex uh to bring together a great number of allies and partners in any common mission space and electronic warfare is a pretty challenging one um and it just by its nature so i think first some high level issues that make interoperability difficult first is a different perspective on what it is in the definition of what's included and not included i mean and that is it is it just signals we're talking about is it just radar emissions and electronic emissions or do you mean everything from signals intelligence all the way to uh tactical ew on the battlefield if you're going to look at it as a comprehensive area first i think you've got to get everybody with a common perspective um, you need a common language then to discuss it you need common doctrine I think you would also need some common standards for what you would bring together and so on. You need a common security approach. How will you bring all the information together, protect it, disseminate it? What uses can it be put to? And then maybe from there you can move and operate. The way we tend to address it within the NATO framework, if you, if you look at it in two categories, maybe one is an acquisition issue and one is an operational issue. First in acquisition, um, my colleague who leads defense investment would probably have run a series and has in this case frankly would have run a series of of working groups across allies to try to define the technical interoperability standards so that as systems are acquired on an individual national basis or maybe even in group buys across the alliance as a whole or in groups of nations within the alliance they'll have a common um, set of standards that the systems would meet no matter who produces them and who acquires them uh, the data exchange we would register and so on. So you've got the proper data fields uh, with the corresponding classification and so on. And you go from there. And then my colleague for operations or defense planning, uh, as well as the international military staff would work together uh, with our military commands, allied command operations and, and allied command transformation to work through the military details so that the forces could come together and use those systems properly. So um, sounds very complex because it is. But again, after 75 years, um, a lot of the, the machinery is well oiled in these areas. We've, we've identified a number of new war fighting areas for the Alliance over the past decade or so. So think hybrid cyber space as some big ones that I would list as operational domains 
and then there's all the corresponding work that I just um, quickly rattled off that the um, headquarters and other components would tackle to try to set standards for interoperability and kind of help guide allies as they move in that direction to be coherent together. Back to you. Lindy, I just, you know, Dave did a great job at um, listing off the, the technical interoperability data kind of issue. I just add to that um, trust and understanding it is really, really important. It goes um, back to that working together, understanding each other, cultural competency. Um, you know, General Berry has a saying that um, relationships plus partnerships equal trust. I think there's a big part of that because, um, you know, understanding the technical aspects is one thing, trusting the data and a partner and understanding what they can bring and what you have to offer is really important. I think the other thing that might be useful is, is a very, very quick vignette on, on Russia-Ukraine. Um, Ultimately, I, I think um, during the, that first year of the invasion, we overcame bureaucratic and antiquated procedures, um, as well as technical obstacles that previously seemed insurmountable. So I think that's a really good lesson to take away. You know, very rapidly we required we, we identified the requirement for rapid sharing of information with a, um, a non-traditional partner. Um, there was some great work done in policy, uh, dynamic policy adjustments in the policy environment. Um, and even a new delivery mechanism of a system to allow secure communication uh, across multiple partners so that information, there was a broad base of information awareness on requirements and, and information. I think that's a really great vignette on how we can respond at short notice. I, I think one of the things we've learned from that is we need to need to foresee that for the future and we need to condition our data and condition our holdings so that we can allow for rapid sharing when, uh, when we build those coalitions of yet to be determined composition uh, around a challenge or a threat. So another question for you, um, again, is that tied into this, when will Stone Ghost be replaced? What functions will it have and what is preventing it from being delivered earlier? Right there. Sure. Um, yeah, this is a little technical. I don't want to lose anyone, so I'll keep it brief. But, you know, I think of Stone Ghost as two things. One is a is a desktop system and one is a superhighway. The superhighway is, is strong and growing and evolving and meeting the needs, constantly being managed by partners. Um, the, the desktop is, is becoming um, most pleasingly antiquated and unnecessary. So uh, if you look at um, Mr. Kasser, our fantastic CAO here at, at DA, and look at his um, presentations to DOTUS last December and the December before, he talked about a system called Torch. Um, and that is the closest thing we have to allow embeds here in the US to really meet their full potential and, and utilize the skills and the unique and diverse perspectives and, and uh, history and experiences that they bring um, within the US system. So um, I, I, I encourage the, uh, the question to ask, those who are asking the question, and check out the releases from DOTUS um, and you'll learn a bit more about that. Awesome, so we had a question come in. What are some of the key constraints? Francis Tamer, who is a professor at Exeter asks, to better information sharing across, especially particularly the Five Eyes Alliance, but I think is relevant to you too, David. And then Anthony, Corona also asked, is the size of the US as, a, as an IC partner and the size of its intelligence community a deterrent to information sharing with other countries? Um, you can speak to that at all. David, did you want to start? Yeah, sorry. Uh, my finger moved too quickly across my phone uh, for me to plug back in. So what are they? So let me take both actually uh, just just briefly on both. What are the key constraints to better info sharing across the alliance? I don't think there's any technical constraint that we can't address in this in this era. Um, you've got all the right knowledge for cryptography, for the hardware, for the comms paths. I think it really comes down to the to the personal factors as as Michelle and I said quite a few times. Trust, importance, uh, the an understandable result that's, that's compatible feedback on how it works, uh, the utility, and so on, uh, again, with the proper security is the thing. If people choose to give these agreements life, they'll give them life. They'll make it work. They'll find a way to get it done. Because as I say, I, I don't think there are many technical constraints that we can't solve, if any. So I think for me, the key constraint boils down to the choice to share. And it really is a choice to do it. Um, and then, sorry, I didn't actually write the second one down. I just wrote is. So could you just remind me one more time? No, I mean, that, that, you, you answered it. What are the constraints? Is the size of the U.S. one of the constraints for information sharing? 
So if yeah, you thanks. have a thought on that. Well, it's, so, sometimes it is um, because it can be overwhelming. I mean, I think there are more U.S. agencies now than when I left in November of 2019. And I think for some of the smaller nations uh, with smaller services, it can be a real challenge as you as you deal with multiple partners. And sometimes you do, I would argue, have to make choices how many you can deal with. And that's why I think some nations choose to work first through frameworks, uh, whether NATO or other frameworks, because you've got um, you've got a buffer, a common interface that you can go to one place and you can bridge into many as opposed to having to sustain, um, you know, uh, hundreds of bilateral arrangements. And as Michelle said, I mean, you're going to choose based on what your national interests are, the task at hand, the information sensitivity and so on. But I do think for smaller nations and smaller services, it can be a bit overwhelming. I mean, I'd just say to to a U.S. audience, I mean, keep in mind that that you think about our scale, um, again, with 19 or so agencies, how many people that is. Um, some services that I that I deal with might have 100 personnel total in the service. And so for them to, to try to deal with um, myriad services and myriad nations simultaneously, I, I know can be overwhelming. Um, but it's all manageable if you choose to make it so. Back. Lindsay, I, I completely agree with Dave on the uh, technology is not the problem. And I, I think um, our innovative enterprise and um, really prides itself on the technology is never the problem. Um, and when Dave talks about choice, I kind of put that into the policy bucket. And I think we do have some antiquated policies. I think we've shown great um, agility in responding to a dynamic policy environment, um, but actually determining what does it mean to, to, to be in the era of strategic competition, it probably um, you know, has, a, has a different um, impact on some of our policies. Is the size and scale of the US too big and an impediment to integration? That's a huge part of your power. That's a, a huge part of, of, of why you um, drive so many incredibly effective and capable partnerships and alliances. Um, there are plenty of uh, embedded and liaison partners, both five eyes and beyond, who I think help the US in cross-leveling uh, initiatives and capabilities that the US don't always see themselves and driving some efficiency and say, hey, you know, this person's always also doing that and bringing things together. And we see that a lot because you might find that the same um, people or the same organization will be liaising across a number of the, if not all of the, the US IC uh, elements. And so there is some benefit there to partners bring, helping us bring together. Um, I don't think that's a particular um, barrier to integration. I think culture uh, and policy are, are greater barriers. And, and the culture that Dave spoke to very early on about um, young analysts and the first and foremost trained in, in that counterintelligence perspective and, and so, somewhat fearful uh, when they lack the experience to understand how and when they can uh, share and integrate with partners. So Abe Borum asked a question that's near and dear to my heart, and I think there's no answer, but I would like to hear you guys try. So how do you avoid duplication of effort across what you're doing across your alliances? Obviously that's hard even in the US as we talk to the size and scale. Um, David, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks. Look. Um, I, I'm of the mind that duplication of effort isn't always a bad thing. Even when you do it within your own nation, it's not always a bad thing. Um, philosophically, right? I mean, I've done a lot of strategic reorganizations over the course of my career, either as a participant or a victim of them, or as somebody who was tasked with trying to lead key components of it. Uh, structural redundancy, I think, is a polite word of saying useful duplication. If it's if it's intentional if it's done mindfully and you build in the cost of the duplication to have redundancy fall back a second view of things i think it's it's critical in fact to have the duplication it does come at a cost but i just say um i would avoid a sweeping statement that duplication of effort is wasteful uh or is cost that that shouldn't be spent the other thing i would tell you is that again, in our business, whether intelligence or security, and as capable as the US is, I mean, this is where, let me just be a little biased as an American and say, I think we're one of the most attractive partners in the world because of the capabilities and capacities and diversity uh, that Michelle touched upon. Thanks for saying it. 
because I feel like I should have in my answer. But but I tell you that um, I've yet to meet any nation or any service that has cornered the market on knowledge and insight. There is always a need to work with someone else, even if all they're doing is checking you in some of the areas where maybe they don't even have the same expertise that you do, but they're bringing a different way of thinking. They're, diff they're bringing a different cultural context uh, and they're bringing people that, that don't have your biases, your history, your culture, your perspective. Um, I just wrap up my answer here and say, look, I'm often asked, if the US has all this massive capability, why are you even there, Mr. Cattler? What's the purpose of having you there? Why does the US have to make these contributions? And, and I've already mentioned this about no one's cornered the market, but I'd also say that the NATO alliance is very powerful and works on consensus. And I'm a huge believer, especially now that I've spent this four years here, that the intelligence sharing also helps us build a common perspective that helps build a shared view for political and military decision making and sustains solidarity. These decisions are taken by all allies and we operate on a consensus principle. So if they don't agree because they don't see the same thing and they can't appreciate where they're coming from, and I think intelligence is instrumental, uh, unique in many ways in illuminating uh, complex issues and explaining them to policymakers and decision makers, uh, you've got a problem on your hands. So this is also why I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm convicted on this topic of partner engagement and information sharing, because I think it just enables so much and such, sets such a strong foundation for all this very important common work we have between us. This has been a fantastic, oh, you wanna go, Cheryl McGinnis? Oh no, I, I can't, I can't better that answer. It was a great answer. I would just say that for the unintended duplication, there's been a great focus over the last 18 to 24 months here at DIA and across the 5 Enterprise to, to really integrate uh, across our, our functions and disciplines so that we don't have the unintended um, the duplication or in fact, you know, diverging, diverting away from the key, key main efforts. So we've gone to some structural changes to actually help us achieve that both here at DIA, but also across the 5 governance forums as well. Fantastic. And we're nearing the end of our time. I, I, I know these are always such good conversations that I could talk forever. My parents also thank you because I was an international affairs major in college at GW and they want, they've wondered for almost 20 years why I had that major. NATO, I finally got to talk to NATO and the Five Eyes. So thank you. This is like a career defining moment for me. My last question is going to be about OSINT and how that plays a role in what you're doing. But it's my last question. So I give you carte blanche as moderator to basically talk about whatever you want to talk about. If you have like a closing thought or um, related to kind of an overarching conversation we've had across this series is the role of OSINT and how it's changing the IC. Um, so I'll start with you, General McGinnis. Ah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think in this era of ubiquitous data, um, our ability to manage and process OSINT is such a force multiplier, particularly when you talk about partners and alliances. You know, when you can actually deliver intelligence and information and information advantage um, through open source, uh, then you absolutely, um, you, you multiply your op options in sharing, again, with the public and with partners and allies. Uh, I think um, there's, a, oh, I know there's a lot of work going on this, in this agency who have some enterprise management responsibilities for, for open source, which, you know, drives tradecraft and, and how we do it and how we manage it. I think there is a great role for industry and our partners as well in that, as we look, and Dave already touched on um, the increased focus on AI and ML and how we manage our data. You know, I think in the business world over the last five years or more, um, with the evolution of, of, of platform businesses, whoever owned the data wins. I think for us, whoever processes the data wins. And I think that actually our, our ability to harness and process um, open source intelligence is critical now more than ever. Um, DIA recently produced a, um, a study on Iranian UAVs, which was put into the public and was incredibly impactful. And we maintain, which is a, a, a long, we have a long history of maintaining open source products, but they're getting um, more and more comprehensive as we get greater access to publicly available and commercially available information. It, it is a huge treasure trove of information. And I think, um, I think uh, a director in the 70s said that he assessed that, you know, 70 something percent of what we did was open source, I think we'd argue it's now in the 90s. So it's incredibly powerful, it's incredibly enabling, 
Um, and it does get to the heart of, of partners and allies in greater sharing and interoperability, ensuring that we have that all-informed net. And Dave talked about ensuring that we have, um, uh, you know, we, we identify dissent and that we can make our information contestable by all those diverse perspectives. Um, so I just add the criticality of OSINT. We're putting resources into it. It's really important. I think it's a, it's a force enabler. It really does empower our partners and allies uh, and us to share and build greater trust and understanding of each other. And so same question to you, David. How is OSINT changing what you're doing at NATO or any parting shots before we close out? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll be brief, but um, a few points on this. I think when I think about open source Intel, I think about it in terms of what I can take in and um, what goes out. And I think what we take in, you know, Michelle talked about, I, I think I'm just, I'm, it always makes me feel old when I, when I get this question, because I think I'm shocked at the diversity, the, the depth, the capability in open source resources that are available today. I mean, I, I think there are so many things that I see on Twitter, on Telegram, uh, on the internet that, that private companies, um, like, I mean, look at the GeoInt providers that are making um, really breathtakingly uh, detailed and accurate GeoInt available to the public that they've either exploited or that's available for private sector for even individual hobbyist exploitation. It is amazing. I mean, these are capabilities that would have only been available to nation states with advanced collection capabilities, what, five, 10 years ago? So I think there's a huge revolution in the amount of information that's available. And, and look at like aircraft tracking and aircraft spotting, uh, maritime tracking, all these things that are now being done in the private sector and by private citizens. So I think there's just this huge wealth of information that's available that, that intelligence services can draw upon. Uh, differentiation then becomes very important. You know, well, what's your role then in that marketplace? What do you bring into the party? Uh, we're very expensive. Um, intelligence and security services. And I think I'd echo what Michelle said. I think first it's about curation of the data, what data is most useful and important, where can open and closed information sources be complementary so that you can you can really do some, some cool things to bring them together. And I think for analysts who hyperventilate about um, our craft going away uh, because the computer is going to solve everybody's problems. You know, chat GPT-4 is going to be the answer. I'd say analysts are super smart all the time. I think they're the most sophisticated form of intelligence officer because they know how to ask all the right questions. And I think the computer is going to be a huge help to go through all that data. But I think the reality of it is that the people who can form the best questions to draw from open source or from any data source are going to be the ones who can give the best insights. But let me touch finally on the on the outside issues. I think certainly we can leverage even more experts because there's huge diversity across the world. I mean, you have billions of people. And if you know who to pay attention to in the in the public sector, again, you can you can really draw resources from uh, private corporations, universities, and think tanks. But something that I feel like public officials don't say enough, so I just put stop as the last part of my answer is accountability also. Uh, I think it's great that the public can increasingly hold intelligence and security services accountable for what we do, the value that we provide, and especially for legal and human rights compliance. And I think that's made a whole lot easier when we disclose a bit about what we do. We testify, we participate in events like this and so on. Uh, so again, thanks to INSA and thanks to you, Lindy, for facilitating. Um, but I think also for accountability, because increasingly the public can, in fact, witness war crimes unfolding using that combination of resources that I touched upon and can demand action from their government and can spur change in international affairs because of the tools and the information resources that are now publicly available. And I think that's huge, uh, especially with this horrific war that Russia is pursuing it in Ukraine. And I, I wouldn't have time to go into all the nasty bits of it where open source is critically important, but I really just encourage people listening um, to this uh, to take a look at it because I think it's hugely valuable and I think it will be even more so in the future. Back. Fantastic. I think I'm at the end of my time. Oh, there's John. He has perfect timing as always. Thank you, John. Thank you so much.
Okay, I'm unmuted now. Well, thank you, Lindy, uh, for doing such a wonderful job today, facilitating the conversation into our guest, uh, David and General McGinnis. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. I, for one, learned a great deal. Um, also, we'd like to, of course, thank uh, Kinetic for underwriting this important series. And our next installment will be in October, and it will focus on trade craft and data. So stay tuned, more details to come on that. And also picking up on the last uh, uh, comments we just had, uh, talking about open source intelligence, our listeners, uh, I'd like to let you know that on Thursday, INSA will host a breakfast and panel discussion on open source, the art of the possible, uh, here at the INSA Conference Center in Arlington. We'll discuss some of the themes uh, that were, were re uh, talked about this afternoon, including how open source information is used to support mission operations and the importance of public private sector collaboration uh, at needed speed and scale. We have a really great lineup for this program with representatives from NGA, Lincoln Labs, the Institute for the Study of War, Jane's North America, and moderating the session will be former DIA Director, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Bob Ashley. It's going to be a really fascinating conversation. We hope you can, can join us and registration is um, uh, will be available. Thank you all for taking time uh, to join us. When the webinar ends, there'll be a short survey that pops up. Please take a few moments to complete it and let us know how we did. Again, this concludes today's program. Thank you and have a nice day.